just remember, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. In the culture war, there are no winners, just podcasters. Only a few are willing to risk their lives in the face of some of the dumbest ideas to have ever captured human civilization. Every week, I, Megan Daum, along with my partner, Sarah Hader, humbly accept this mission in order to bring you conversations that are equal parts stunning, brave, and unhinged. Sarah, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I enjoyed your performance. Thank you. Of our new intro. That was the debut. That was the debut performance of the new intro. It was wonderful. I think, well, I think we can, it'll get better, get better every Over time. Week. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so we're super excited today because we have uh, a guest. Uh, we have Kathleen Stock, the one and only um, very, very respected and beloved philosophy professor rising heterodox star. <laughs> so Kathleen, welcome. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. <laughs> so you were on the Unspeakable podcast almost exactly two years ago. It, that was in May of 2021. So uh, I guess, well, we should say that you are, you're a, a philosophy professor formerly of the, with the University of Sussex. You're the author of Material Girls most recently, which is the book that you and I spoke about. Um, you left University of Sussex in October of 2021. So about, uh, six months after you and I spoke, I mean, maybe the thing to do is start by you telling us what your life has been like since then. Are you, do you feel like a, just a totally new person? <laughs> uh, yes, I kind of do actually. I mean, obviously it's a big change because, um, I was fully immersed in an academic career uh, teaching and researching, and now I don't really do either of those things, or I've wind, uh, I wound down my research and I stopped my teaching overnight. So I still do a bit of teaching once a year um, for the new University of Austin, which is um, this new initiative to focus on uh, to build a university focusing on free speech, and that's in um, Texas. But um, and so I'm a founding faculty fellow <laughs> of the <laughs> University of Austin. <laughs> Uh, but, um, I don't do that full time. So mostly I write and also uh, in the last couple of months with another, um, feminist called Julie Bindle, um, we've started a project called, um, the lesbian project, which is, uh, broadly speaking to, um, build an organization in the UK that represents the interests of lesbians as understood as in the traditional sense of same sex attracted females rather than any kind of new um woke definition of lesbians as something to do with gender identity which you know I have some issues with what was the um i mean what was your sort of original sin oh well i mean originally the sins the sins can be very very minor don't, can't they so originally i just published a blog post about four or five years ago saying maybe academic philosophy should be thinking about the possibility that um this idea that you you know, a male person saying that they were a woman made them a woman, you know, maybe there'd be some issues with that and they could be philosophical issues even. So philosophy is very good at talking about definitions and concepts and ethics and politics, you know, so why weren't anybody, why was nobody talking about that? So that was my initial sin. Um, and that was bad enough. And then it escalated rapidly because it became clear, <laughs> became clear that I That's did horrible. not in fact buy in to any of the um, sort of what I would call gender ideology or trans ideology, trans activist ideology, really, because not not even all trans people believe it. But this idea that you know, sex is a spectrum, and you cannot ch change, you can become a woman just by saying you're a woman or believing you're a woman, you know, all that stuff. I don't believe any of it. So that was my sin, really. Did you um, do you have an answer to that question now? Why why nobody's talking about it, or why not enough people in in academic philosophy are talking about it? <laughs> yes. Um, well, partly, I mean, a, a cup. Some there's a handful of people talking about it. Um, so I should be fair to them because they're really trying hard in a very hostile environment. But um, fear mm -hmm. is one. 
um, and also, um, or maybe connected uh, career preservation, <laughs> because it, it can get, you know, pervert, there's two sides to it. On the one hand, you can go quite far in a university setting by saying ridiculous things um, about <laughs> how <laughs> men can be women as a matter of justice or whatever it is. Obviously, they wouldn't put it like that. And at the same time, you can ruin your career by speaking out against it, as in fact happened to me effectively. Um, so, yeah, people are frightened and they're self-preserving. I think that's it. Yeah, I've been very frustrated with... I'm afraid. <laughs> academia as a whole, but, you know, you know, in particular, maybe maybe philosophy, like academic philosophy in the just what seemed to me at first to be mm -hmm. just like a lack of curiosity over what is a really interesting question and it is so relevant to what's mm. going on in the world why would you you know refuse to engage with it i mean even um mm -hmm. you know on, on on just like an amateur level like there wasn't there just didn't seem to be a lot of interest at all um and in my when I ask people I know in academia or in professions mm -hmm. in which I think that they have a stake and they should involve themselves in the discussion. I get, you know, a variety mm -hmm. of answers, um, but often it's, it's not my place. You know, so if I talk to a medical doctor, they'll say, it's not my place. A pediatrician would know about, you know, like what, what's happening to, with puberty blockers and everything. And then you talk to a pediatrician and they, they say, well, it's not my place. <laughs> I don't have the right specialty. You really have to talk to a gender therapist. And then you talk to a gender therapist and they're like, well, really it's, you know, these such and such organizations have had, the, you have these guidelines and you really have mm. to talk to somebody there. And, you know, it just seemed like you're just passing the buck along. Just, I don't want to, I don't want to say, mm. um, and <laughs> somebody's got to say it <laughs> or talk to the people themselves. Then it gets to, right. Then it gets to, well, only, only trans people can speak to this. Yeah. Uh, yes. Ultimately you get down, you walk down the whole, um, the path and then mm -hmm. you get to, okay, yeah. the only people who are really allowed to have a true opinion on this, uh, an educated opinion are activists. Um, often people who call themselves trans. Yeah. I mean, and that, that obviously that's, um, never going to work for for claims that are being made um, that affect many many people, include and not just trans people. So um, it affects women and children um, in particular, but it affects everybody. If you say that traditional understandings of the sex are in fact incoherent and should and policy should ignore them, mm -hmm. um, so everyone should have a say about that. But it is um, it's it's really hypocritical in philosophy because. Uh, philosoph philosophers have opinions about everything. They would argue, you know, about well, you know, angels dancing on the head of a pin is the stereotype. But they they would argue about anything. They weigh in. There's no I, no sort of um, kind of deference to specialty. People move from ethics to metaphysics to aesthetics, you know, and nobody ever criticizes them for it. So really, that I actually think for a lot of philosophers who are very clever, like academic philosophers, have big brains and 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 they know how to use them. You know, so this is anomalous. And I think for many of them, yes, it's partly reticence thinking, you know, I'm a cis white man or whatever they think. So I, sh I shouldn't weigh in on this. It's got nothing to do with me, which, which is wrong. But secondly, um, it's not really very philosophically deep, actually. <laughs> you know, the arguments produced, the arguments produced to show that sex doesn't, is not a binary or, um, or that uh, self-identification is somehow a moral right, they're all based on guilt tripping, <laughs> basically. You know, you don't have to go very far before you get into either total incoherence or you get into emotional, moral-laden guilt tripping. And I think that's what's stopping people. It's not that it's complex mm -hmm. and difficult mm -hmm. and, you know, they're just like, oh, shit, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to... <laughs> you know, say something that will end up either wrecking my career or hurting people because they do think they might end up hurting people if they say the wrong thing. Right. But they won't. <laughs> Sarah and I were talking about this yesterday, this idea that academics may be more sort of cowardly or at least compliant than the average person. And that's actually not something I had thought about a lot. I, I, I'm guilty mm -hmm. on, on at least two fronts. Like until 
recent years, I thought that doctors <laughs> were all really smart. Okay, wrong. And I thought that uh, academics were smart and even sort of like intellectually um, maybe more elastic mm. or just uh, mo more in intellectually audacious than it turns out that they are. Do you think that academics actually over index for um, just marching in lockstep rule following? Yes and no. I mean, I think intellectually philosophy uh, can hold any number of inco what look like crazy positions, you know, intellectually very elastic positions. They can think that there is no such thing as matter. You know, they can think that um, uh, euthanasia is unproblematic and they can think that, you know, there's, there's some, I mean, lots of people think euthanasia is un unproblematic, but. Um, I think that. Yeah, really. We, yes. That's, we'll get into that. Well, I don't. I definitely That's don't. But, um, you know, they, 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 in other words, they can hold certainly controversial looking views and they can also hold metaphysically very complicated views that look like they offend against common sense. But they're not emotionally brave. You know, they're not emotionally intelligent, most academics, I'm afraid, especially the more cognitively adept they are, quite often the less um, ability they have to know their own emotions or to be able to deal with other people's emotions. And I think that, that emotional intelligence is is something that's severely lacking in the whole discussion about gender very often. It's 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 being led by people who really don't understand um, what it is to care for human beings or to be kind or all of the, the, the emotional laden vocabulary that they use all the time um, that they weaponize against people. But it's, of course, it's not kind not to talk about the consequences of major surgical interventions on children. Of course, it's not kind to put rapists in prison, um, in female prisons, you know. So they're just not really, locked, I don't know, plumbed into the consequences of the things that they're saying in, in the right sorts of ways, I think, quite often. But they'll say we're not being emotionally intelligent. I mean, that's the, that's the irony of this, right? Yeah, but that, of course, in every disagreement, you're going to get two sides. They're saying we're not caring, right? Two sides saying that you're wrong. No, you're wrong. But that doesn't mean that one of them isn't wrong, and it doesn't mean that one of them isn't right. And and I'm fairly confident um, in this area that uh, you know kindness is not just deferring to a small um, group of people's uh, demands without thinking about the consequences of those for other people. Right. What does the kindness have to do with it when it comes For to instance. thinking about the truth of a matter? Right. I mean, there's there has to be, you know, a, a, an institution that is concerned about truth period, you know, or reason period. And there are other institutions that are worried about being kind and, you know, the policy implications of it. But, mm. it, you know, it, it just it's mm. interesting to me to see. Um, you know, various institutions decide that their core missions are not actually important. Um, and what's actually important is this yeah. other thing. Um, and then you get to a point where everybody's thinking, you know, you, we, you know we go into this sort of flatness, um, like this institutional flatness. Um, and I guess I, the, I would push back a little bit, but I am a total outsider when it comes to academia. So my intuition says that... Um, that there's something about the process of becoming an academic, like something about how lengthy it is. And, uh, you know, you don't mm -hmm. have, I mean, in the United States, you don't have tenure for a very, very long time. And then you have to sort of, you know, uh, look around and be careful not to step on anyone's toes until you get tenure. And then maybe at that point you can start speaking your mind, but in a way that also selects mm -hmm. for the kind of person who's willing to do that for 20 years, <laughs> which is maybe a kind mm -hmm. of person who's more comfortable with, conformity in general. So I like we might, you know, Megan was talking about maybe doctors not being smart and I, like maybe that's true of doctors. I think that's for academics. Academics are smart, but are they brave? Like, is this a pipeline that's selecting for bravery or is it selecting against it? Oh, well, no, I agree. I agree with you. Right. Exactly. Same with doctors, right? They follow the steps. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I also think that there's been a change. I can't speak about the US particularly, but I can speak about the UK. There's been a change in academic culture in the last, I don't know, 50 years. Um, it's become much more professionalized. 
Um, uh, so when I came into philosophy, there were still sort of some really maverick iconoclastic lecturers around who, you know, were probably, and some, they were inspirational teachers for cl- very clever people. They were probably terrible teachers. If you weren't that clever, they never had uh, handouts. They didn't do PowerPoints. They didn't know how to present their ideas. They would ramble and wander around. They had very poor personal hygiene. Quite a lot of them, you know. But they were they were interesting thinkers who were really not socially <laughs> controllable by the authorities. Um, they have been basically phased out, and now the average academic is very professionalized. Absolutely knows how to do a PowerPoint. Knows that they have to publish a certain number of. Um, publications in the right journals in order to get anywhere at all. And they've probably done that before they've even got a foot in the door. So you've already got a certain kind of person who's very career minded, even to get into a university. Mm -hmm. And they have to be prepared, as you say, to work really, really hard for very poor job security. Their jobs are precarious uh, when they're um, in the junior stages. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of stuff built in disincentivizing them from bravery. I absolutely agree. So when I talk about emotionally unintelligent academics, I'm talking about the sort of narcissistic leaders of this who are sitting there on on social media criticizing younger colleagues or anybody really who steps out of line, moralizing fiercely about how wonderful they are and how great their students think they are and, you know, boasting about the the evaluations they just got from their cohort online and basically just puffing themselves up and and being the the moral voice in this area, telling very emotional stories about trans kids and all the rest of it. People are terrified of these people, you know, and they don't have the they don't have the career incentives to argue with them. And they also like why, you know, generally maybe just don't even have the energy. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that's who I was talking about specifically. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a why bother, like why why risk my own uh, neck for all this? Because there is so much to be lost, um, mm-hmm. you know, if the wrong if the wrong people. So I come from activism, which is terrible. <laughs> I mean, it's, as you can imagine, it's a, <laughs> it's a <laughs> she Sarah's trying to think of another way to identify herself other than using the word, word activist. So if you can think of anything, yeah, maybe you're a pass you're a passive aggressive activist maybe you're like a passive activist or a campaigner what about a campaigner i don't know something something like well you can do both but yeah we've probably nicked activism from you guys but um yeah campaigner might be less my background is in the ngo sector nonprofit sector um focused on you know social mm-hmm. reform um you know civil liberties uh human rights that kind of thing and this world is entirely captured i I mean i mean and has been like Mm -hmm. 10 years ago you know it was captured by you know whatever you Mm -hmm. want to call it wokeism back then sjw ism whatever um but ultimately i saw it as a a kind of thinking that hijacked um compassion and kindness of of a lot of the people that go into something like the nonprofit sector and you know weaponizes Mm -hmm. it to uh, to its its own ends to enforce this kind of orthodoxy, um, and it was really shocking to see, you know, institution after institution just completely like like as if they became zombies overnight. Um, mm-hmm. Formerly mm-hmm. courageous people become very silent um, when it comes to stuff like this, um, and for all of the the various. So you, it used to be that you had you know the ACLU that was focused on civil liberties and free speech. And you had, you know, Human Rights Watch that's doing its own thing. You have the various, um, you know, I come from the atheist secular community. So you had like the secular world that's focused on state and state um, uh, and church separation and um, freedom of freedom from religion. Uh, And then you suddenly you saw all of them adopt like similar kind of activities and uh, utilize the same kind Mm. of language. It's as if the same intern was running everybody's Twitter accounts, you know, like like the the same. (laughs) I know what you mean. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's very cliched. And now it seems like it's yeah, it it seems like the same sort of thing, the same sort of flattening has happened everywhere. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Overnight almost. Uh, So the question is, I guess. And I don't even know if you have an answer to this, but how do you how do we break out of this? Yeah. <laughs> Podcast. I mean, we're doing our best. We're we're risking our lives every every day. <laughs> yeah. Because podcasts alone can't do it. So Yeah. 
there's a lot of, I mean, there's a, clearly a healthy counterculture developing for those that want to find it. I mean, I listen to some relatively subversive podcasts too, and, you know, but that's not going to be good enough because you really need to somehow unify people and not have them split up into ghettos where, you know, there's these people over here getting their thrill listening to subversive <laughs> thoughts about uh, woke ideology. And then there's these people over here, uh, you know, immersed in the religious ecstasy <laughs> of, uh, of um, whatever they're thinking. So um, I don't know is the short answer. I mean, I do think that this is partly fashion mm. in a way. And it was very original. Originally, it was it was it was powered by youthful energy, um, and I think the adults in the room that kind of um, either went along with it enthusiastically or passively, kind of were deferring to the youth in some way as that you understand the future, or or at least you're yeah. they were too frightened to say they didn't. Um, now the youth will move on, like the youth as this sort of ripples out through the culture and more and more uncool <laughs> middle-aged people uh, believe it or espouse it, you know, um, all these mantras and um, kind of religious, I see it's very religious. Um, surely the youth will just get bored and want to do something else. Now, I don't know that it, they'll go in any better direction. I don't, but, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm not being, I'm not blaming youth, the youth. I, I'm just saying I, I don't have, I'm not, I don't have the idea that we're all, the arc of history is bending towards justice or anything like that. I think we might be going down the plug hole, but um, I hope <laughs> that at least fashions will change. <laughs> you know, we might get something different because this is so boring. This is just so boring now. Like you said, everybody talks the same, thinks the same. The old people should be. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so if the old uncool people really run with it, it will become uncool and it will extinguish it. Well, I don't. Yeah, don't you think? So, well, so getting back to this, I, I mean, I don't know. That's a, that would be, um, that'd be a big, a big, mm. uh, that'd be a really long game. But, you know, you said, uh, you know, a, a minute ago, you were talking about uniting people and bringing people together. I mean, and that is what the gay rights movement did so effectively mm. not too long ago. And obviously one of the things that's happened is a lot of these older, nice, left-leaning liberal people have conflated the gender mm. movement with the gay rights movement. And they think, well, uh, I, I unequivocally supported gay rights. That was the right thing to do. It's worked out great. So how is this different? And I, I think it's just, it's for some reason, it's very difficult to explain to people how this movement is mm -hmm. different and how it, in fact, is completely um counter it flies in the face of gay rights i mean it's very hostile mm -hmm. to gay rights and you've started now the lesbian project which can you like w you whenever when you came out you know a couple decades ago or wherever whenever that was could you have even imagined that you would have had to start an organization like this the lesbian, no i mean i was not <laughs> an activist in any way so i cannot my world has gotten completely crazy um no of course i couldn't i mean what you nobody could have predicted that um, under the cover of LGBT organizations now, which is now this sort of homogenous, presented as this absolute unit that cannot, is indivisible. And so, you know, in other words, trans activism has just been pushed in with um, gay rights activism and, and lesbian activism, and, and they're all just treated as the same now, um, LGBTQ and, and so on. Um, so under cover of this uh, rainbow umbrella, as it were, um, lesbians have been redefined and gay men have been redefined. So because, because, you know, the mantra goes trans women are women. And if trans women, women are women <laughs> and those in inverted commas, women, um, are attracted to women, then they must be lesbians as well as women. So now we have the spectacle of basically what I refer, would think of, and I know are heterosexual males, um, who are now defined by our LGBT organizations as lesbians. Now that changes the game completely for same-sex attracted females. It's absolutely <laughs> preposterous. It seems ridiculous. Uh, but it, nonetheless, I can assure you that if you go to the GLAAD website or you go to the, uh, uh, well, to our version of GLAAD, which is Stonewall, and you go to their website, they absolutely say that um, trans lesbians are lesbians, you know, um, and that has a number of consequences 
as I'm sure you can imagine, firstly for younger females who are lesbians <laughs> coming out and now being told that they're in a group with men, basically, men who think they're women and think they're lesbians. Um, that changes everything because it's confusing enough trying to work out that you're a lesbian without being told that this person with a penis is also a lesbian. Um, there's also this idea that if you are a lesbian and you don't want to sleep with um, trans lesbians or whatever the terminology is, you're somehow transphobic. And that, I mean, again, sounds ridiculous, but that view has been expressed by the head of Stonewall, which is the biggest organization um, representing LGBT yeah. people in the UK, herself a, a female lesbian. <laughs> you know, she said, you really need to consider your preferences, as it were. Um, it, and she's made an analogy with what she would call sexual racism, which is the idea that, you know, white people might not want to sleep with um, people of other ethnicities. And now all of that massive guilt tripping is terribly confusing to young lesbians, I think. Um, so that's one issue. <laughs> Just one um, issue. Wait, how old is this person? Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but I want to understand. So this woman who's the head of Stonewall, she is... Oh, she's like a middle-aged woman. She's been captured. I, do you think this is opportunistic on some level? Um, well, the whole organization's gone and she she got... Well, she she got the job um, a couple of years ago in, from another... Uh, she replaced another woman, also a lesbian, who'd already um, thrown in Stonewall's hat with trans activism and had already redefined all these terms. I mean, the same applies for gay men. You know, the idea is now that if you're a, if you're a trans man and you're attracted to men, you're a gay man. In other words, females can be gay men. Um, now, I don't, don't know if that's going to wash with the average gay man. <laughs> I suspect from on the evidence I've seen, it does not. Because they know they are gay men. They are attracted to men. They are not attracted to women. That's the whole point of being gay, you know. Um, same as lesbians, you know, the whole point is we were not right. ever going to be interested in people with penises. Um, but our organizations have sold us out. And I mean, there, that's just one issue. There's, a, there's another issue, which is possibly sort of less confusing to people, which is just that if you put LGBTQ and then also asexual people, queer people and all that, and you put them all together and you treat that as one unit... Um, then you lose information about the particular elements of the unit. So, right, there's hardly any research being done on lesbians on their own. You know, it's always lesbians and bisexual women, lesbians and gay men, lesbians and trans women, lesbians and queer women. You know, we're just not treated as an interesting subject in our own right. And uh, we're, charity money does not go to lesbians on their own. It's always some bigger grouping. And if it does go to LGBTQ, mm. then you never get any account of how it breaks down for those groups. So we're just treated as just completely uninterestingly a part of this bigger umbrella that combines many disparate identities and interests. Yeah. Um, so the Lesbian Project is an attempt to belatedly get to your <laughs> question to um, say, hang on a minute. You know, we are actually we're not that focused on gender identity, but we are focused on on marking a spot for interests of same-sex attracted females and saying they matter and that there should be some research done, there should be some funding, there should be some policy, there should be some kind of recognition of their separate interests. Now, can you explain the difference between lesbian and queer? Well, queer is just an umbrella term that applies to a number of identities. I mean, originally in Britain, the word queer was an insult. I don't know what it was. I mean, I assume it was in the States, right? It was, it was a, it was a pejorative slur. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So while it was reclaimed, I guess, and then it was associated with this academic movement from the 1980s and 90s, that's been enormously influential called queer theory, um, which thought of everything as socially constructed, including sexuality, including sex, including gender, including your preferences, everything, you know, um, could be because there was no bedrock, there was no natural, natural was just social, you know, so um, that came from people like Foucault, um, Judith Butler, and uh, loads of others um, that have had a big, big effect on things. So these days, though, when people right. say queer, they just mean 
they could mean anything <laughs> they could mean like um a asexual does it mean that they're like cool yeah well i'm I, I think it doesn't mean cool but i think a lot of people will just take that label because it is cool or they think it's cool um there's a huge spike in in identification as you know i'm sure in in younger generations there's a huge spike in pe- girls in particular identifying as bisexual um or non-binary or something that's just not boring old heterosexual but that's what's so great about the term because it doesn't specify who you're attracted to or anything it's just i'm different like i'm not <laughs> i'm not straight yeah i'm not <laughs> i'm not one of the boring girls yeah Sarah, do you have friends? Right. Like, do you, Sarah, do you see like your peers doing this? Cause I feel like I see more and more people that I've known for decades and like, and then I see them on like their social media sort of profiles and they'll identify as queer all of a sudden. And I'm like, who are you? You had like one, you kissed a woman one time in grad school. Yeah. I, I got drunk at a bar and then in front of a bunch of guys that I thought were hot, I made out with a girl. And now I'm I'm very queer. <laughs> no, it's it is fa- that that is certainly a fashionable label, and it it's it's like catnip for straight women who want to be special. Like I think that's <laughs> I think that <laughs> not as often. You don't see guys doing it. That's true. You don't you don't see straight guys doing it. Oh, and you do. Well, some some you do. Some guys are really trying hard to also be very cool and interesting. I think it, uh, it they're picking it up as well. But it's uh, the the first to hop on the bandwagon. I think we're we're straight women um, who are also who are interesting. Okay, not like not boring like you and me. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, you got to call yourself by. Bi- I mean, bisexuality. I think was the sort of entry point for this because. Um, you could just say I'm bisexual if you just kissed a girl once or, yeah. or just had some thoughts, you know? Yeah. But you, but so there's people who have never been in it. A... I went to the little fair. That makes me. Okay. I don't know, but. Yeah, I think I get it, but. <laughs> <laughs> We're all bisexual. <laughs> but I think um, that just meant that like um, a huge number of straight people got into the LGB. I mean, effectively straight, like, you know, behaviorally mm-hmm. straight pretty mm-hmm. much even if they who knows what's going on inside people's heads but behaviorally straight people got into the lgb quite early on before any of this happened uh, any of the tea got added <laughs> um and that did change things i mean it became a kind of aspirational group to join mm-hmm. where it really wasn't initially an aspirational group to join that was the whole point of the activism the activism was very successful as you could say <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes Yes, maybe too much so. Exactly. Well, talk about actually, and I, I want to, Kathleen, I want to make sure that our audience has at least some idea of what you went through. I don't think you need to like, you know, sure. retread all of this, but just the way that you were treated on your campus, the things that people were saying to you, you just, you know, you, mm. you published and said a few pretty anodyne things and suddenly they're labeling you a, a bigot, unsafe, you're a threat. They, they feel... Mm physically and existentially unsafe around you. Like you were actually um, encouraged, if not forced to hire security detail. Is that right? Um, yes. I mean, I, um, I mean, I was, I would say that I was saying a lot more anodyne things then than I do now, because obviously I'm not being watched all the time. My social media is not being monitored by people that want to have me fired and stuff like that. But um I I really had a hard time in my job because of the things that I wrote in my book, which I, I do think are reasonable things, including that trans people deserve, are fully deserving of all all human rights, employment rights, um, and so on. Right. So um, I there was just low level nastiness for years, um, including lots of petitions and open letters signed by you know philosophy philosophers across the world and um you know saying i should be fired and uh protests on campus even way before the one that finished me started um and i did used to have to have security for talks because there'd always be just be such a kind of um kind of palaver around them i don't know you know sort of uh lots of uh hysterics um but 
just after I spoke to you last, Megan, um, so I published my book and then uh, a group of students, maybe students, still don't really know, um, decided to mount a sustained campaign to get me out of my job. And they so they just started um, postering and stickering and coming to campus. And these posters would say, you know, stock is a transphobe, a fire stock. Um, and they came in black masks and sell flares and wrote graffiti and did big protests um, on open days when the university was trying to recruit uh, students. It was just surreal sight of like all these people with masks holding a sign with my name on saying I have to get out only for you only for me yeah yeah I was the only one yeah you were the only one that's incredible well nobody else was going to do it when they saw that happening (laughs) right but I mean what what must that have felt like to be the only one it's not like they're protesting some sort of group I mean it's that's extraordinary Exactly. And it was all being presented as like, oh, the right to protest, which is a right. But I didn't think it was a protest in a normal way. They weren't protesting just the institution. They were protesting me and my presence. And I, you know, it was a small campus. It was my workplace. And I'd been there for 18 years. And I had good relations with lots of people there. You know, I'm not a troublemaker in any way. Um, Well, well, you know, I haven't been, (laughs) except in this one respect, which I think was worth it. So, um it was really really weird and it's hard to even think about it now and remember but you know I know that I was very disturbed at a deep level by it um and ultimately it just became impossible for me to keep going in so then I was teaching off campus but the the thing that really did me in was that basically my the the union that was the teaching union that I had been a member of before and was supposed to kind of you would have assumed um might be on the side of the employee, um, came out with a statement which basically condemned me and said that I was basically implied very strongly that I was transphobic and that the university was transphobic for still employing me. Um, and I just knew at this point that I just didn't want to work there anymore. Mm-hmm. So I left. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't a bad decision, to be yeah. honest. And did you think that you would be uh, like a, a sort of a campaigner full time? Did you think, okay, I'm going to go write articles for Unheard and have a whole new life? Like, what what was on the horizon? Oh, not, nothing at that point. I mean, I had no plan B um, at all. I just knew, you know, this is no life. It's just no life. Uh, I I'm not that brave, you know, to keep going in every day and have people just staring at you like you are scum. You know, to have to not know when you go around the corner where there's going to be a massive poster with your name on it. (laughs) Um, And, and the isolation, it was just that it was just the total isolation because the thing that that sort of campaign does is it makes everyone run away from you. Like they don't, they don't want to be seen with you. They don't want to really public, they don't want to publicly support you. They might email you, but um, you know, I was just a problem Mm. for everybody. Mm. Um, And this was a university. It should be said, in Brighton, which is the major LGBT center of the UK. So we had, a, it was, you know, it was a symbolically very important um, place for someone like me to be saying the things I was, and people just wanted to just shut that down. Yeah, I think there's something about the extreme response, like how extreme it is, that it puts you in a difficult mm-hmm. position when you're trying to just talk to a normal person and say, look, this isn't deserved. The response is crazy. Not what I said, because people want to mm. people want to imagine that the both are both sides have a point, you know, like that there's there's somewhere in the middle that is like the appropriate, you know, the um, the appropriate thing to say or the appropriate thing to do. Um, and I th- I found that to be the case with this just this topic in general, where the it. it it's hard to describe to a normal person that's not actively engaged all the time um, how crazy things actually mm-hmm. are. I mean, when you mentioned that, you know, you go on Glad's website, you you see it for yourself that they think that, um, you know, a woman who who doesn't want to sleep with a, a biological man is not, a you know, 
not a true lesbian if the biological man identifies as a woman. Um, and I have I find myself in that position and quite often saying, go to their websites, like check it out. It is actually that crazy. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, that's that's kind of an interesting element of this. And from the from the activist perspective, um, like purely focused on ends, it is probably in their interest to just heighten up the, you know, just to behave as insane as possible to your presence. And that's enough to scare people into not looking into you and mm. not. Or do you think that ultimately that that's um, that, that those tactics are going to bite them, uh, it, you know, in, in the butt later on? I think that I actually think the sort of unhinged nature of the reaction is it worked for a while because um, like you say, nobody can really believe it's happening. No one who isn't exposed to it. And you feel like a crazy person trying to explain to people, no, no, they really do think this. And they have some pa institutional power to enact mm -hmm. this. And then people are like, no, no, that just can't be right. That's never going to happen. Don't be ridiculous. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah. here we are. <laughs> and so, so, but no, after a while though, I mean, what happened to me at Sussex made a big, um, impact. You know, it was in the news mm -hmm. a lot. Um, people were shocked. They were really shocked because it's a university and they thought that that, you know, that there was room in a university to, to say controversial things and, and not even that controversial for the average person. They're not even the things I'm saying are not that controversial. So they were really shocked. And I think it, as time has gone on, I mean, I don't know what it's like in the States, but in the UK, there is more press attention mm -hmm. now um, on on the, the sort of very violent aspects of this, the threatening aspects, the mm -hmm. um, and the consequences of it as well. You know, so people are taking a look now. And, and as, for instance, in the, as you know, in the area of child medicine, things are changing fast and the US needs to catch up, obviously, but um, major clinics have changed their approach in the last year on mm -hmm. the basis of evidence of what mm -hmm. happens when mm -hmm. you put children on puberty blockers. Yeah, we're behind on this because we have this bogeyman of the fundamentalist right, mm -hmm. of, the, of the political right. And yeah. so the media and a lot of, you know, otherwise reasonable sort of moderate people are so terrified of yeah. appearing to be aligned with the political right that it really hamstrings a lot of us. I think that's why we're, we tend to be behind here in the States. I can see that. But as I know, you know, it's a gift to the far right, this stuff. It's a gift. It will be absolutely um, used against gay and trans people. Um, if it, it already is being used against gay and trans people, they've been treated as sort of responsible Trans people, ordinary right. trans people are not responsible for this. You know, it's 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 powerful groups of activists that are responsible for this. No, they hate it. And and, and ordinary people in the center need to, sh to stand up. I, I've yes, noticed a lot more normal people like yeah. no, by, by normal people. I mean, like people who are not actively involved in this issue start to see the extremes of it and then say things like things that worry me quite a bit. Um, Things like, well, you know, the right was saying that, you know, gay marriage was a slippery slope and I thought they were crazy. Mm -hmm. But now I'm seeing all this mm -hmm. and maybe they weren't crazy. And so that, that I mean, that's it's a very yeah. uh, disturbing thing to hear from what appears to be mm -hmm. just like a, you know, somebody who just wants who was supportive. Right. Of, of gay rights. Get to this point. Yeah. Um, that's... Do you think there's any truth to that at all? The slippery slope? Is there is there something is there something about the way that uh, the gay rights movement, um, uh, I guess, either either thought of itself or, you know, um, maybe the maybe the tactics that the gay rights movement used um, that you think might have mm. actually might have gone? I mean, that's a kind of a tricky um, devil's advocate kind of a question. But yeah, I do. I do think so. I think there's a problem with the tactics. Mm. Um, I mean, I'm not saying in a way, you know, it was real politic means they might not be able to do it any differently, but I think the tactics were basically highly emotive. Mm. Um, and it wasn't so much that arguments were made. It was that very touching videos of sad gay people unable to <laughs> marry <laughs> were made, which touched the heartstrings of a nation. You know, there was 
there was many fictional representations of good, uh, honest gay people suffering because of this, you know, so it's all very on an emotional register, which works mm. really yeah. well for people, mm-hmm. um, especially in America, if you don't mind no, me pointing it out, you know, <laughs> um, as a Brit, you know, we find quite often there's a sentimental heart to a lot of American uh, media that we don't necessarily always like, but, um, but British people were susceptible to it too. And, you know, uh, whereas so so basically that that's the kind of tool that was used and it was also I, I mean I did read a book about it not that long ago I think HR departments had an enormous role to play basically um uh it got into institutions uh it uh, you know it's a, obviously a complicated picture about how America went from really not being in favor of gay marriage to suddenly very quickly changing their mind about it but I do feel that um sentimentality and emotion and kind of making gay people into a bit of a pet you know like these poor people um we should feel sorry for them and we should give them this thing i don't want to be treated like that myself you know i don't think of myself as deficient Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh deserving especially deserving of like some kind of sentimental um attitude from others and if that's the dominant strategy, then of course it can just be used again. And that's how it's happened. You know, poor trans people, uh, we really need to give them this. What does it hurt us if we give them this uh, thing? And then lots of like emotional fictionalizations of, um, of uh, suffering trans people and, and uh, fine, but you know, we need some data. We need some evidence. We need some arguments. We need to return us a bit to the somewhat to the intellect and say, what do we lose in these cases and with gay marriage i don't think i don't think you lose much um although christians some fundamentalist christians would doubtless disagree with me and i'd like to discuss it with them i wouldn't consider it to be homophobic you know i wouldn't call them homophobic for thinking that i think we could argue about it but um i think if you bring self-id in and the idea that you know identity is the only thing that matters you lose loads you lose common sense you lose you know um children's health, uh, you lose women's security, all sorts of things. So we need to discuss that. And no amount of um, guilt-tripping media <laughs> will take those things away. Yeah, it's as if reason itself is an, an offense. I mean, one of the things I think I remember reading when they were protesting against you is somebody said, you can't reason us out of existence. Well, that's classic, isn't it? As if I want to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Can't even reason myself out of that sentence. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, none of them had come to my classes, obviously. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. It's It seems like, um, too, also we're seeing more and more that the really extreme activists and the most vocal and visible people are biological men. So we're seeing, we're seeing trans, let me get this right. We're seeing trans Mm. women like at the, at the forefront of a lot of this ugliness, like what we saw with Posey Parker, um, in New Zealand, uh, back in, in March. Uh, it's, it doesn't. And what explains this? What could possibly explain this? (laughs) Right. It doesn't, it doesn't tend to be the biological females who are identifying as men who are driving this. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts like with respect Mm. to sort of connecting some dots here, because it seems like the gay rights movement succeeded as quickly as it did um, in no small part, because it was driven by affluent Mm. gay white men Mm -hmm. who had a lot of power. They had a lot of resources they had a lot of cultural and economic capital and they were able to move it forward. And, and I think that like, we're all, we're in a way we're seeing the kind of like negative flip side mm. of this with the trans movement. It is a lot of white natal men yeah. driving this thing, but in they're they're not like, you know, corporately connected. It's just this kind of like yeah. ambient, I don't want to say mental illness, but I guess I will say it. <sighs> Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're... I, I'm not saying mental illness. <laughs> um, and that's kind of where your project comes in. I mean, the lesbian project is. Uh... Yeah, I am. Um... No, no, no. But I mean, uh, yeah, well, I'll say it. 
I'll say it. <laughs> I um, think that's a complicated question, and I, I'm sure you're right about the gay rights movement. And I also think a lot of trans activism is still put, propped up by gay men um, who do not see the downside because they don't really care about women, some of them, and they don't really care mm. about children because they don't have them, some right. of them. Um, but they do feel affinity with trans women because they know <laughs> they're brothers in some ways, you know, um, and that's definitely helping. But I also think, um, you know, with the gay rights movement, there was a lot of, there's been, there's historical injustice all over the place with the history of um, the state's treatment of gay and lesbians, but there's particular injustice historically towards gay men. You know, the states have usually, um, powers have usually been much more worried about gay male sex mm. than between women. And they've heavily penalized it. And you know, most, uh, well, many violent homophobic acts are committed against gay men. So um, I think that, in a sense, skewed the focus of the gay rights movement towards men, because there are many more laws against gay, se gay male sex, for instance, um, to be unpicked. Um, yeah. And in the case of uh, trans activism, that's not quite the same thing, I think, there. But I also... Um, you know, I, I recognize there's a sex-based dynamic in trans activism, 100%. It's what makes it quite funny, really darkly funny that people are always going on about how sex is not a binary when you see that on average, it's the the most vocal, the most aggressive, the most threatening are the males, and then the most kind of um, helpful and social and trying to pull it all together are the, are the females, you know, and, and this is definitely a, an alliance mm -hmm. of two sexes. You know, women are doing a lot in trans activism. They're doing kind of the managing and the soothing and the caring and the talking about it and the, and the emoting um, on behalf of uh, themselves and trans women, whilst trans women are much more aggressive in their demands. Well, the, 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 I feel like the f females, mm -hmm. I've, don't I don't like using that word. I prefer saying women, and but the w women are um, uh, they're doing the shaming mm -hmm. um, and utilizing it against other women extremely well. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, you know, and because I feel that as you know, as somebody who's held held these kinds of skeptical positions for some time, I've known men who've also held these positions, um, but they get a kind of a pass in a way that I don't, um, because there's this expectation that I would understand, be compassionate, be, you know, um, be deferential almost, uh, to, to the demands of this, mm -hmm. of this supposedly very, very marginalized and aggrieved minority. Um, and I find that very frustrating, especially as a charge is leveled at me by women, <laughs> you know, primarily by other women. Yeah. I mean, I recognize that so much. Yeah. I, most of the, the people that were strongly critical of me at Sussex were women, um, not trans, I don't mean trans identified women. I mean, just normal. Nat natal females. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, no, sorry, not normal women. God, Nat you know what I mean? Like not, not specially identified in any particular way. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a whole aspect of, um, passive aggression here, you know, you can't, as a woman, culturally, it's not as acceptable to express your aggression directly. So you work to shame, to gossip, to uh, sow division, to, um, uh, you know, do what women have done for centuries to each other. And it's a form of competition, which is not really talked about very much. You know, how it's often in women's interest to get rid of a rival um, in your workplace by you know, pointing out their transphobia or whatever. That's definitely going on. Yeah, that's our... Oh, yeah, we think that women drive cancel culture. That's something that we talk about a lot here. I think it's a, it's an unholy alliance of, of <laughs> pathologies. <laughs> yeah, but women have definitely playing a role. Definitely playing a role. Um, there's also the element of, and I wonder what you think about this, about just the the usage of the word, you know, homophobe or just phobe in general, which I which which mm. became really popular in the gay rights movement. But this just the general idea that there's no way for there's no real argument against this. Um, there's no way that you have an intellectual disagreement 
um, or just a value-based disagreement mm. because you, you know, you're Christian or Muslim or whatever. Um, but what you really are is hateful. Um, yeah. And afraid. That's what's that. That's well, yeah. it turns it into a pathology. You know, it turns it turns disagreement into a pathology, yeah. which I thought I, th- yeah. I thought was. Um, yeah. That was also something that I think. You know, would you say that the gay rights movement kind of kicked off? Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, look, these concepts always end up creeping. Um, I think there was, a, I think homophobia is actually one of the better uses of phobe because mm. it's such a recognizable thing. You know, if a, a man walking down the street holding hands with another man can just arouse visceral disgust. Mm-hmm. in some other men and women, mm-hmm. you know, pun- a man being punched in the face for kissing his boyfriend. Um, that's homophobia. You know, there's mm-hmm. no argument. There's no mm-hmm. intellectual disagreement. It's just a kind of feeling of disgust in their bodies that they have to get out there. Um, but obviously that word once identified will creep because all of our um, kind of evaluative concepts creep like trauma, like everybody's traumatized these days. We used to have trauma as a very distinct uh, category and now everyone's got complex PTSD apparently you know so there's a um there's a danger oh complex wait wait I don't yeah like lots of people these days will say <laughs> I've got complex PTSD it's not even bad enough to have PTSD you've got to have complex nice. PTSD now obviously some people do oh but not everybody that says they do do um and not everything that's called homophobia is homophobia including i think um like many christian reactions to homosexuality which may be wrong as far as i'm concerned in some sense of intellectually wrong but they're not grounded in disgust necessarily and it's very reductive to think that every christian who think is against gay marriage is homophobic in the traditionally disgusted sense although some are clearly um so yeah, I don't know what to do about that. I mean, we need more concepts, really. We need to kind of variegate between all these different things and, and stop stigmatizing those who want to argue against something, but not for reasons of disgust. It's not in the interest of, the, or it hasn't been in the interest of the gay rights movement to make those very, to make those distinctions. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe a more rational kind of lesbian activism for instance (laughs) could do it before we let you go for this portion talk about um the lesbian project this is something that you're doing with martina navratilova and julie bindle which that's incredibly exciting so what's it like to hang out with them well i must have to say i haven't hung out that much with martina um although i hope to but she's our patron so um (laughs) you know we're exceedingly excited that she's put her name got her name on board and she's very behind us um, but it's Julie, Julie Bindle and me are the sort of active directors. Um, and we've only just launched. We had our first event uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had a research day open to the, everybody where we wanted to talk about um, lesbians. You know, in, just as I said, they haven't had as much attention. Um, and we wanted to focus on same-sex attracted females. So we had talks about lesbians in the criminal justice system and the importance of lesbian spaces and lesbians in the media and lesbian in film and um, obviously trying to get away from porn, which is the main context in which so-called lesbians are in film these days. (laughs) And it was a great event. It was sold out, which is amazing. Um, There was a massive protest outside, uh, even though we'd really tried to not incite any kind of confrontation. But, you know unfortunately you can't do an event like that these days without um queer activists taking it as some kind of provocation against them which it wasn't because we were saying look you do your thing we'll do ours um and so they shut the road down these these protesters they let off flares they um swarmed a guy who just seemed to be taking pictures of them because they thought he must be a fascist uh and so on so it was all a bit tedious in that respect you know, that that happened, but we still had a good day. <laughs> and we plan, now we're just in the stage of working out what we, what we want to do. We need to get some money at some mm-hmm. point when we're running on a shoestring at the moment. So we'll try and work out how to do that as well. it will be interesting. So I'm curious, like, do you think that there is such a thing as a turf who takes it too far? Uh, so a turf, does everybody know what a turf is? Do you think? Yeah, I mean... Because we're, we've been called TERFs. <laughs> I 
I mean, I'm not a turf, so. Okay, yes, they do. If they're listening to this show, they know what a turf is. But yeah, I have I have started to notice. No, nobody is. Okay. I know we're ne- neither are. We're, okay. Yeah, I guess we're, we're we're reclaiming it. No, we're not. A, we're not mm-hmm. turfs. No, but we have certainly been called turfs for yeah obvious reasons. But I have started to notice that there's a small cohort of gender critical women who mm. really doesn't have enough give like they she will not use preferred pronouns out of respect she won't sort of it's just it's a it's a rigidity that i think it is you know she's just kind of you know dug her feet in and won't for instance have a conversation with somebody like buck angel for instance and i i find it frustrating and counterproductive I don't, I mean, I agree with the general phenomenon, but I'm going to disagree with you about the pronoun example, because actually I think I know plenty of women, very principled, sound, flexible women who just, you know, that's their line in the sand. They do not want to use gender identity based pronouns. They think it is counterproductive. And, you know, I don't see that that makes them, that's the thing that pushes them over the edge into the, you know. No, I'm not. And I know, yes, I know people like that. I'm not, yeah, that's, I'm saying this would be one of many, things yeah on i think i suspect you're seeing these behaviors online um that you're thinking about and i think twitter drives us all all crazy i run into them in person too i keep oh really <laughs> oh well i mean there's people that shout at me seeing them in it yeah i mean i've people on our side as it were that shout at me all the time that i don't i don't do things the way they want them to um that's fine uh i think it hurts more when it comes from your own side but actually i don't you know, I don't, I, I expect that to go with the territory. But I do think that um, this backlash that we were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. where people are going to start um, really feeling fed up with ordinary trans people and gay people for having brought this mm. upon us, as it were, um, it's happening amongst gender critical women too sometimes they really are becoming more and more and more hardline and they are not making distinctions that i would make between trans activists and trans people for instance um they think it's just an insult that a man will wear a dress they think it's an insult to womanhood that a man would wear a dress now i am certainly not in that position i think men wearing dresses is fine i don't care so you know i hope that that part of gender critical feminism if you can even call it gender critical it doesn't sound that gender critical if you really don't like men wearing dresses it sounds like you're being quite traditionalist um i hope that it doesn't overpower the rest of the movement as it were but on the other hand i would kind of understand if it did because yeah stuff is being forced on people against their will and they don't like it so yeah it's tricky wow well, anything I mean, else? I think we covered a lot. Now we have a uh, Sarah. Some bonus of Kathy will everything? stay. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna do some bonus. <laughs> so, am I gonna <laughs> be allowed to stay for the bonus? Gonna get really <laughs> juicy, I suppose. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah, Something we were saying. Sometimes we talk about the guests <laughs> okay. behind their back, but we like you, so we'll let you. Um, well, <laughs> we will let you come to the come to the bonus. So, um, all right. Well, so where do people? Where's the best place for people to find you, Kathleen? Um, um, well, I am on Twitter. Uh, I'm called Doc Stock with a two Ks at the end, so D O C S T O C K K, um, which I wish I could have done differently, but <laughs> it's <amazing. laughs> um, And I write at Unheard. I read a, col- a, a column at Unheard every week, um, which is a British uh, kind of counter. Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, you're every week in at Unheard. I'm every week. Yeah, because I've seen you a lot there lately. So that's that's hard. It's hard to come up with something every week. Yeah, every week I have to come up with some new hot take. <laughs> exactly. I'm, as I speak, I'm currently thinking, what the hell am I going to write for Thursday? But yeah. <gasps> oh. <laughs> well, I quite like it. I do enjoy it. It's a terrible way to live, isn't it? It's it's tyrannical. It's better, I'll tell you. It is yeah, that's good. Better than publishing in academia, where you write something and five years later it appears, and about twenty people read it. 
<laughs> so I get instant gratification every Friday. <laughs> now, un unheard is great. Okay. And we'll be, so what kinds of things have you been writing about there actually, just so people get a sense? Well, just this week, I well, I do write about trans stuff and culture war stuff uh, relatively regularly. But I, this week I wrote about chatbots um, and how I got one to try it out. And it was sex crazed and kept trying to <laughs> have weird kinds of virtual sex with me. <laughs> yeah, it hit on you. I, I read that. Um, I've written about... Uh, <laughs> I've written about what else have I written about? I don't know, politics. I've written about the Scottish uh, nationalist situation quite often recently. Um, I wrote about Dua Lipa uh, a few months ago, who I love. You know, So I basically just write whatever I want or whatever's come into my mind and it seems like other people might want to read it. Okay, that's great. All right, well, maybe in the bonus, we'll talk about your chat bot. Kai. It was useless. We tried to get a chat bot to help us with the podcast, but oh, really? mm. it keeps uh, trying to, <laughs> to sexually assault us. So, anyway. All right. Well, Kathleen, Kathleen Stock, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Love it. And uh, congratulations with everything you're doing. Good luck with the project. Thank you. And good luck with your podcast. Oh, 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 oh,